Hello everyone. In this video abstract, I'd like to tell you about some work that I've done with David Goluskin, which we titled Minimum Wave Speeds in Monostable Reaction Diffusion Equations. And everything that I'm going to speak about today is coming from a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society A. You can also find a corresponding preprint of this work on the archive at this link, as well as all of the code associated with this on my GitHub at this link right here. And what I would like to begin with today is the concept of monostability. Now, monostability is the presence of a single stable state, typically accompanied by multiple unstable states. And in the realm of ordinary differential equations, we have a prototypical system that describes this type of monostability. And that is the so-called logistic differential equation. As you can see from right here, we have a phase line diagram you can see that there are exactly two equilibria associated with this system. The red one is the extinction state. That's u equal to 0. And the blue one, that's the persistent state. That's u equal to 1. And what you can see is that the blue state is stable, whereas the red state is unstable. Now, we can step up the complexity from the ordinary differential equation model to a related partial differential equation model known as the Fisher-KPP equation. This is a reaction diffusion equation, and you can see that logistic nonlinearity tacked on the end of it. Now, in this prototypical monostable system, we typically find solutions that are referred to as traveling waves. These are solutions that hold an approximate arctangent profile and they move across space at a constant velocity. And what you can see by the color gradients that I have on this wave right here is that as you extend asymptotically, you are approaching either the extinction state or the persistent state from your non-spatial logistic model. Now, in order to better understand monostability in partial differential equations, Let's zoom in on the Fisher-KPP equation to try and better understand traveling waves here. Now, traveling waves are a specific type of solution to partial differential equations. And they are governed by a very specific form. That is, their argument is a single variable, x minus ct, describing the constant movement across space. In this case, the velocity is c. And they also have a steady profile, which I'm going to denote by this capital U here. Now, the advent of using this form for the solution is that it reduces the partial differential equation to a related ordinary differential equation. And you can furthermore show that you can arrive at a first order system of ordinary differential equations related to this. And the advent of this is that this is a planar system and therefore we can use the vector field to better understand trajectories of it. In particular, in this vector field, those traveling wave solutions from the previous slide manifest themselves as heteroclinic connections between the stable blue state and the unstable red state, as you can see in this vector field right here. And it's not hard to see that you should be able to find a trajectory that shoots off the blue state and eventually arrives at the red state. But the issue with this is that you are spiraling into the red state and therefore necessarily your profile is going to take negative values. Now, the Fisher-KPP equation is typically used to model biological populations and therefore this would mean that our profile takes negative population densities, which therefore becomes physically unrealistic. And so in many cases, we can discard the speed uh, traveling waves between 0 and 2. But then we can look at what happens if you look at faster traveling waves, traveling waves that travel with a speed larger than 2. As you can see from the vector field over here, we are no longer spiraling in to that red state. And in particular, you can couple this with some analysis to prove that you always have a heteroclinic connection between blue and red states for every c greater than or equal to 2. 
And therefore, this tells you that you have a continuum of traveling wave solutions that travel at speeds equal to and larger than two. And this is a fundamental characteristic of many mono monostable systems. That is, they exhibit infinitely many traveling wave solutions, and the speed of these traveling wave solutions form a half line in the positive real numbers. Now, unfortunately, the analysis for many other monostable systems is not nearly as simple as the Fisher-KPP equation. In fact, we can very simply step up the complexity by looking at the so-called modified Fisher-KPP equation. You can see that the modification is coming through by an exponent m here, increasing the power of the nonlinearity. And what this is representing in biological terms is what's referred to as a weak Ali effect. It's telling you that the biological population has trouble growing from very, very small population densities. Now, you can follow in, through the same methods that we were using for the Fisher-KPP equation. You can again arrive at a planar dynamical system. But if you think back to what happened on the previous slide, essentially the analysis came down to just linearizing around that asymptotic red state. In this case, that analysis will fail due to the exponent m being added on. And so in a 2000 paper, Billingham decided to analyze this system. And he was able to show that, again, infinitely many traveling waves exist. And he showed that there is this red curve as a function of the exponent m, for which every speed above this curve exists for a traveling wave solution. What he did not show is that this is the exact minimum speed. That is, he did not rule out the possibility of having speeds go slower than his analytic values. In particular, he ran some numerical uh, simulations that showed that he could actually observe traveling waves that go much slower than his analytical upper bound on that minimum wave speed. And therefore, this discrepancy between the analysis and the numerics has motivated myself and my collaborators to start looking at new ways to analyze these and taking advantage of many of the computational tools we have at our disposal now. In particular, we decided to turn to an old technique from dynamical systems theory in order to prove the existence of these traveling wave solutions. Remember, these traveling waves manifest themselves as heteroclinic connections between the blue and the red state. And therefore, we propose to use barriers in phase space in order to guarantee that you either have or do not have such a solution. For example, you can confirm existence by finding a curve for which your trajectories cannot cross. And therefore, you can see that it's going to guide your, uh, your unstable manifold of your blue state right into the red state, guaranteeing a traveling wave solution. You can do something similar to confirm non-existence, as you can see from the far image here. But the issue with doing this traditionally is that the equations that need to be satisfied are quite technical and very difficult. In particular, the equations are required here where you generally describe your barrier as the level set of some general function. And therefore, restricting yourself to that level set, you need to confirm an inequality. Now, this is a non-convex operation because you need to restrict to the level set while also confirming the inequality. And therefore, we decided to turn to some new results which try to recast this idea of finding trapping ba barriers in a different way. And what they work to do is instead of looking for a one-dimensional curve that forms a barrier, you look for a full volume that will be forward invariant for your system. Now, we refer to this as the volume method. And the equations that are required to be satisfied for a general functional W are right here on the board. And what you can notice about them is that they are linear. Therefore, this is a convex inequality that needs to be satisfied for a function W. In particular, what you can show is that any function W that satisfies this inequality will be such that the non-positive regions of W are forward invariant. And what this is really doing by proxy is saying that your w equal to zero level sets form the barriers in your phase space. This is exactly why these images are shaded 
inside of these trapping regions because they are trying to highlight the volume that can be found using these methods. Now, this is still a fairly technical task, even though it is a convex relaxation. And therefore, the numerical implementation takes advantage of a, a number of modern numerical techniques. The first thing that we are going to do is we are going to expand W as a polynomial. This will allow us to tune the coefficients of that polynomial in an effort to confirm the necessary inequality to satisfy the volume method. Now, unfortunately, when you rearrange that inequality, you arrive at tuning the coefficients in such a way that you essentially have a polynomial and you need to confirm that it is non-negative on a certain set. Unfortunately, as the degree of the polynomial increases, this becomes an NP-hard problem. And therefore, we propose to introduce a further relaxation of this problem. And we seek not to find a non-negative polynomial, but we seek to tune the coefficients in such a way that this inequality can be represented as a sum of squares. And by construction, a sum of squares function is necessarily non-negative. But the advent of this is that this can be achieved in polynomial time and can be done quickly and efficiently using modern numerical programming, such as, say, MATLAB. And then, what we are going to do is we are going to confirm this for multiple different wave speeds in order to get upper and lower bounds on that minimum wave speed that should be present in the, in the monostable system. Let me illustrate with how we would find the existence of traveling waves. So this would be an upper bound on my minimum wave speed. You can first start with a little bit of analysis. So if you have your range of C values, so this is C going from 0 to infinity on this blue line here, you can start with a very, very small value of C where maybe with some analysis you can show that you cannot have such a heteroclinic connection giving way to a traveling wave and a very, very large value of C where you can, again, analytically confirm that you do, in fact, have a traveling wave. And then you can bisect. You can check the middle value here, run the sum of squares relaxation, and determine if you can find such a W to confirm, or, uh, confirm the existence of a heteroclinic connection. And you continue this process of bisecting slowly coming down and converging to an upper bound on your minimum wave speed. You can do the same thing by confirming non-existence with the volume method, coming up from below on the minimum wave speed. And as you increase the degree of that polynomial W, we find that you arrive at sharp convergence on the upper and lower bounds. If we return to the modified Fisher KPP equation to illustrate this, the convergence is so sharp, in fact, that we find agreement between the upper and lower bounds for the minimum wave speed up to the fourth decimal place. And this is illustrated, or these values are illustrated by these purple dots, which I've overlaid on Billingham's figure. And you can see that they lie almost perfectly along his numerical observation. To illustrate how sharp these bounds actually are, I'm just providing a simple amount of the data from m equal to 3 here. You can see the upper and lower bounds are very, very close, and wedged right in between them is that numerical observation due to Billingham. Now, in this video, I've spoken almost exclusively about Fisher KPP type problems. But I do want to emphasize that these methods are broadly applicable to a wide range of scalar reaction diffusion equations. Anything of the form right here will be uh, amenable to this analysis and this numerical treatment. Beyond just a scalar equation, we can turn our attention to multi-component reaction diffusion equations. In this case, the numerical treatment becomes slightly more delicate as one has a phase space for the associated ordinary differential equation is typically larger than uh, 2. And therefore, I'm going to leave this treatment for another video where we can look in depth at some of these higher dimensional systems and how we can arrive at novel results in these cases. Thank you very much.